From the start, Ted Price seemed destined for something big. I remember asking my dad to buy me an Apple IIe. And I said, Dad, if you buy me this, I'm gonna make a video game and make a million dollars. And I was 10 at the time. And convinced two brothers to join his fledgling venture. The odds were definitely against us. Yeah, we were only three guys and we had no experience. We didn't know what we were doing. Some days were tough. There were times where we really thought we were not gonna be around for another week. And their name was Symbolic. We were all insomniacs at that point. We weren't sleeping at all. An early disappointment almost doomed the young company. Critics called it the dark horse of that year, or the best game that nobody ever heard of. But a little dragon would save the day. They said that the first Spyro, I think, is the number five PlayStation game of all time. Insomniac would shock fans with an unexpected choice. It was really hard to leave Spyro behind. He's, you know, he's kind of my, our little baby. As they move on to create a new universe filled with captivating creatures. This is the remarkable story of Insomniac Games. It all began with a simple request. I remember asking my dad to buy me an Apple IIe. Uh, back when they had the monochrome monitors, I said, Dad, if you buy me this, I'm gonna make a video game and make a million dollars. And I was 10 at the time. And figuring out what he didn't want to do. I was controller for my uncle's medical company. I realized that my long-term interests did not lie in the medical field. And I wanted to do something that was a little bit more artistic. I loved games and had always been into computers and into computer games. And in 1994, with his Princeton degree, his savings, and a dream, he makes the move. And I thought, hey, why not? It's gotta be easy, right? Making video games, and man, <laughs> I didn't know how, how off I was on that. And I was very, very fortunate to run into the Hastings brothers. He has only six degrees of separation from meeting his partner. My mom was talking to one of her friends. At a party in Virginia. Who happened to have a son at Princeton. Her friend's son was roommates with Al Hastings. Through them, uh, word got to Ted that I was a programmer looking for a job. And so I called Al up and talked about uh, what I wanted to do with the company. He was really into it, except that Al is one of the quietest guys I've ever met. I guess I was thinking, I hope he likes me. Al probably uttered a few words. Oh, gosh. But by the end of the conversation, he had agreed to come out to California. Boy, I sure don't know much about making games. <laughs> Of course, neither did he. Which to me was pretty amazing because he was taking this huge chance on a guy who had never done a game before. The odds were definitely against us, so we got, we got lucky, really. And the lucky streak continues for Alex and his brother. I was a math and literature double major, and I, but I've been programming since I was 12. I talked Brian into quitting his real job and coming to make a go of it. I was working at a pacemaker company and I had a, had a really good job. My dad definitely didn't want me leaving that. But Brian has an idea and a mind of his own. And when we brought Al's brother on board, Brian, then that kind of completed the circle. And naming the brand new Southern California company will prove to be an obstacle. There were some great ones. There was Ragnarok, uh, let's see, Black Sun Software. I was, thinking, I was just putting random words together, thinking what, what two things go together. I just thought Moon and Turtle, and I thought, well, this is going to be great. Everyone's going to love it, and uh, no, nobody loved it. I wanted to name it The Resistance Incorporated. And we ended up with Insomniac just on a whim. It was just something that suddenly made sense. We were all Insomniacs at that point. We weren't sleeping at all. This ambitious trio with a name, but no game, uses a legacy as an influence. And Doom was the inspiration for our first game, Disruptor. It was a first-person shooter. And then there were four. Once I got done here and got working on the project, I realized that Disruptor wasn't just a Doom clone. So that graphically, we were doing some beautiful stuff. Any hesitations I had disappeared very, very quickly. You know, from the get-go, we didn't have a lot of ideas about what we were going to do, only that it wasn't going to be a Doom clone and on 3DOs. The talented troupe sets its sights and future on a doomed game platform. We'd actually gone to Sony and talked to them a little bit about the PlayStation, but the dev stations at that point were priced way out, way out of our reach. Well, there was quite a bit of little cult following to it uh, in the developer circle. 
and 3DO seemed like the first one out there. And so we have to create this big uh, Doom-like universe. But we didn't have uh, any 3D tools to do that. And so what we did is we made this, uh, we read everything out of an Excel spreadsheet. Well, Ted and I put together a demo that took us about a month. Really, we were just showing that, okay, we can put together the nuts and bolts of a game. So every single polygon, about you know, thousands of polygons here, would have to be added by Ted into the spreadsheet and convert it over. It wasn't that much to look at, but it was a start. It was a sort of a functional first-person little engine and environment. And along comes Mark Cerny, a universal video game executive. Mark was impressed with the fact that we did this in a month, knowing nothing to start with. Mission complete. And the young exec signs the baby company to a development deal. We were really happy to have a three-game contract where we knew we could stay in business for uh, you know, two or three years. And in a twist of fate, it is decided that Insomniac's first game will also be Universal's first title for the PlayStation. We were able to switch over to the PlayStation fairly easily because Al had already developed such a robust engine on the 3DO. First of all, it went from about 10 hertz to a solid 30 hertz. So it got you know, three times faster. The PlayStation 1 was, was much, much more powerful than the 3DO. Disruptor may have been a dark title, but some humor unintentionally works its way into the game. Think fast, shoot fast, and kick it. Here we were working with Universal Studios and we're at the young technology startup and what better chance to have video games and movies come together. The story was supposed to be serious. Are you ready for your first training mission, Private? Sir, yes sir! Even though the, the movie sequences we recorded were funny because they were so cheesy. Your job is simple. Run the gauntlet. They're horrible. I'll get your butt out alive. Disruptor is released in December 1996 to very high hopes. Unfortunately, there were a few magazine ads. There weren't any TV ads. We had a little PR where we had some editors come by the office, but that was it. So most of the sales were through word of mouth. Maybe it's time you tried it out. It was definitely a critical success. It just wasn't a financial success. But what really made us happy was that critics called it the dark horse of that year, or the best game that nobody ever heard of. I think it's sort of become a cult classic at this point. It's well remembered. Insomniac will eventually say goodbye to first person shooters and hello to a charismatic baby dragon. By 1997, Insomniac Games had released Disruptor, a first person shooter inspired by the world of Doom. It received rave reviews, but had very disappointing sales. Yeah, I think we were encouraged that we did it. We made a game, and it was out there on the shelves. That's nothing too shocking. And there were times where we really thought we were not going to be around for another week. I want you to get through the chem factory alive. I think they impressed the Universal enough that they weren't going to let us go. We were just very fortunate and appreciative to be alive. Mark Cerny, one of the fledgling company's earliest supporters, puts in his two cents for their next endeavor. He was looking ahead to the next couple of years of the PlayStation and realized that the demographics were quickly moving downward. And the video game troupe changes their direction. I wanted to do a game that uh, my mother would be able to play, and, and she didn't like Disruptor very much. I think we all wanted to do something that had a more mass market appeal. Yeah, Craig initially threw out the idea of, of a dragon. So instead of flying all the time, he's more of a young dragon who walks and glides. We kind of messed around with that. We did some uh, sketches and... Once the idea was suggested, it kind of clicked with all of us individually that why well, wouldn't this suit us better? We don't have to try to be better than the next guy. We could just be kind of whimsical. And a young star begins to hatch. I think we felt really confident right from the first character drawing. At that point, we thought, OK, now this looks like a mascot character. This looks like something that could be big. His name is Spyro. And his world is unlike any other. Well, it's vaguely medieval, but more fantastic. It was one of the first games that really had distant views, where we were able to create these very wide open environments. And that was a result of Al's engine. 
being able to create multiple levels of detail for the environment. The game that is supposed to be fun is having some serious labor pains. I have to say that there were points in the production cycle where we were in crunch mode, just like every other development team, and things looked fairly bleak. Never fear, Spyro, the cute little purple dragon, meets the deadlines. His mission on the PlayStation is to rescue his dragon friends from imprisonment. Thank you for releasing me. All while searching through vast environments and hidden chambers for clues. But the 3D platform game doesn't receive the reviews Insomniac was hoping for. The previews and the reviews in general talked about Spyro being a kitty game. To see it called a kitty game implied that it was a very simple, novice-oriented game that wouldn't satisfy the hardcore players. Following promising previews at E3, Spyro makes his debut in the fall of 1998. And, well, he doesn't exactly fly off the shelves. In Europe, it took off pretty much from the get-go. Uh, but in the US, it definitely was slow. It didn't catch on right away. But then after Christmas, uh, just based on word of mouth, we kept on having a solid weeks, you know, bigger than the, the launch week. And it just didn't taper off, you know, through January, February, March, it just kept on selling. Audiences, like from young kids to their mothers who had never played games before, were attracted to this. By the time we really Spyro 2, I think we'd had almost 2 million in sales just in the US. And Spyro becomes a sleeper hit. I was at the DICE conference and they said that the first Spyro, I think, is the number five PlayStation game of all time, or it was some really high number. And I was very surprised by that. But the celebration is short and the pressure is on. The team that has grown to 13 people is asked to create the sequel by the next Christmas selling season. We were under the double pressure of having a truncated development cycle and trying to come up with something that would make this game feel like more than a sequel, something that was a little bit more revolutionary than evolutionary. And jumping on board this time is Peter, another Hastings brother. When my older brother came on, they were starting to be concerned, you know, that that's two out of three lost to the dark side. And when my younger brother joined, it's, you know, it was all over. The future is closing in for the folks at Insomniac. Where's the new game? We scrambled, threw out a lot of ideas, and finally settled on the mini games in Spyro 2, which really set it apart from the first game. The sequel, Spyro Ripto's Rage, finds the cute purple dragon caught up in another unlikely adventure. This time, freeing a kingdom from the ill-tempered tyrant Ripto. I hate dragons! Yeah! Doing so requires collecting items from the game's 20-plus levels of explorable 3D worlds. The story, I think, was a little bit more mature, and I think we had a lot more cinematics that showed off what the animators could do. And what about the name? That's funny because the Japanese version of Spiral, if you look at the title, it looks like it says Ripto in kind of funny tangled letters. It debuts in the fall of 99. Definitely nervous. What if the first one was a fluke? And the answer is no. Reviewers tout the more adult game, and it sells big time. We had grandmothers writing us that they had stolen the game from their grandkids because they liked it better, so they wanted to play it. Sony wants a third Spyro game for the 2000 holiday season. No one at the company named Insomniac will be sleeping anytime soon. In Spyro 3, we had four new characters, then they had their own little home worlds, and so you could experience their home worlds from their perspective, and then they all tied into the story. We were able to take the focus off Spyro somewhat and put it onto these other characters with their own moves, their own levels. It really breathed a breath of fresh air into the franchise. The third game, Spyro Year of the Dragon, is released in time for Christmas 2000 and revolves around stolen dragon eggs. Find the eggs and bring them back, Spyro. You got it. Spyro has acquired some new tools, a skateboard, tanks, submarines, and even a speedboat. You can play different characters, a kangaroo, a yeti, a flying penguin, and others. And guess what? It's another hit. All three titles win industry awards in many categories, and all three become part of Sony's greatest hits collection. The combined sales of the three Spyro titles is well over 8 million units. We were really scraping the bottom of the barrel to come up with new ideas for Spyro 3. Well, at that point, we were really starting to think about you know, what comes next. So we decided that it was better for us to start with a new franchise, try to come up with a new character, 
than to try to just push Spyro again. It was definitely a little bit sad knowing that this was the end. You know, reading all the fan mail and knowing that, okay, we have to say goodbye. But it was the right choice in the end. We just wanted to shake hands and part ways with Universal and then propose something new directly to Sony. Although fans of the franchise can look forward to future adventures with the dragon, it will be produced by another company. Insomniac had to say goodbye to their quirky little dragon. It was really hard to leave Spyro behind. He's, he's you know, he's kind of my, our little baby. After releasing Spyro Year of the Dragon, Insomniac has grown to over 30 people. The three original founders are still surprised by the incredible international success of the Spyro franchise. There's a perpetual feeling that, you know, you're not as good as you can be. And if you don't keep improving, you'll be left behind. Insomniac shocks the gaming world when it announces it's leaving Spyro behind for a new game and character. So I'm thinking, what if we made that code right there a little bit smaller? Personally, a lot more nervous releasing the first one of a brand new set of characters or a brand new whatever we're doing. Maybe if these guys animated yeah. less. How about that? Yeah, okay, you could do that. Alex leads the push to create the new game franchise on the bigger and better PlayStation 2. He's got better low-level problem-solving skills than anyone else I've ever met, and that's what you need for the PS2. I don't think there are very many other people who could really tackle a PS2 the way he has. It, it definitely was a quantum step to move from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2. It was very, very challenging, but I think that was the exciting part of it. It was kind of mysterious because no one really knew what the PlayStation 2 could do quite yet. It's funny how things work because I think now we could probably create a Spyro level in about two days, <laughs> where before it took about four weeks. The Spyro franchise began with the birth of a cute little character, and so will the new game. Well, the initial kernel of the concept came from Brian Hastings. He, you know, he, he said, you know, how about we do a space adventure with some gadgets? That idea was a science fiction theme because that's about as far from Spyro as you can get. The new game called Ratchet and Clank features a lead character who is, well, a little atypical. Ratchet is a Lombax. Now, you've probably never heard of a Lombax, and neither had we until we started this project. We basically made it up. If you pull him apart and dissect him, he's got kind of a lion's tail. He's got a somewhat humanoid kind of body. He's got big cat ears. He's got kind of a dogish face. The Ratchet's kind of like this, you know, underdog character that lives on this backwater planet, and he just dreams about, you know, seeing these fantastic worlds. And his cohort in this adventure? Am I cool now? <laughs> yeah, you the man, Clank. A tiny robot who spends much of the game riding on Ratchet's back. Clank we tried to create the exact opposite of that, where he's very book smart. Do you run on standard XP-18 sister boards? Version 7.66. But has no world knowledge at all. I myself am not a robot guy, per se. <laughs> Nerd. I like him. But he's good at heart. So the two of them have that in common but their everyday struggles kind of are at odds with each other. One thing that most people don't know is that Clank is a playable character. Clank has his own challenges in the game where he gets to use his special abilities that Ratchet doesn't have. Once you kind of play the game a little bit, you just fall in love with the characters. And how is this different from their first beloved franchise? Ratchet and Clank draws from some similar elements of Spyro, but we've pushed it in a whole different direction. We have a lot of different elements. There are shooter elements, RPG elements. For the people who have really not been into the Spyro games, as you get just a few levels into this game, the complexity of the things you, that you have available to you really ramps up. And it's a beautiful collection of fantastic worlds. It's a different galaxy where spaceships and Robots and high-tech gadgets are the norm. So there's technology everywhere you look. There's some really amazingly incredible detailed worlds. People are just going to be astounded by the visuals. Every different vantage point can really have some outstanding views. And all of the characters, both big and small, have multifaceted personalities. Some of the characters are angry. Oh, yeah, but it is weak. Veek, veek. We try very hard with all of our characters to make sure they're not plain vanilla. Every time you encounter a, a character in Ratchet and Clank, they're going to have a very strong personality. The two of you make me sick! And what about the weapons? Sweet! We really didn't want parents to be upset when their kids played this game. 
there's no blood, sure you are blowing things up. We couldn't get around it, that's the gameplay, that's what happens. But you don't blow something into 50 pieces and see a blood splatter lying on the ground. You have an arsenal of more than 30 gadgets and tools and weapons at your disposal. Real men can spin without silly toys like that! And this is a game for everybody. I think it's very accessible. You don't need to know a whole lot about video games. The first and foremost core of the gameplay is action. But there are some puzzles that are fairly cerebral. For people who do play video games, this offers something different for the genre of games. There's just so much stuff to do. Compared to Spyro, there's 10 times as many moves you can do, 10 times as much stuff you can blow up. And what can we expect from Insomniac tomorrow? I think the sky's the limit, really, with Insomniac. That's why I love it here so much, is that everyone's just working so hard to make the best thing they can. I think as long as we're loving what we're doing, hopefully people love playing it. That's our real hope, that we can get a good response from the public. People saying, that was really fun.